So, Bob, uh, emails, what do you say? Yep, let's do it. Middle tier patron Megan from Arizona, she says, My therapist and I have determined that our therapeutic relationship is likely coming to a close and that, and that I will be graduating from my time in therapy with her. I am wondering if it is appropriate to ask to see her notes on our sessions from the past few years so that I can have a summary of what we have worked on. Or is that weird to ask for? Is it a confidential thing? Is it inappropriate? What do you say to that, Bob? It's not confidential. I mean, they're your notes. It's not inappropriate. They are your notes. If a client asked me that, if asked me for that, I would talk with them about what they wanted. Um, did they just want to read them? Or did they want me to write up a summary? And in any case, I would charge them for the time. Yeah, it's not weird to ask for your... Well, it, it's not inappropriate. It's not inappropriate. It's unusual. Yeah, it is unusual in all... Like, how many times in your career has anyone asked for your for the file? Nuts. Never. Well, one person, but they wanted to use the file in a divorce proceeding, and right. I resisted that as legally, and but as strongly as I could. Did you give them the file? No. Well, you didn't give them the file. It was a couple, and it gets kind of tricky with issues of confidentiality when only one person consents. Yeah. Yeah, so I had a talk with our lawyer about that and um it's been a bit so i don't remember all the details but um i don't want my notes to be used for no. any kind of divorce or forensic purpose and i will resist that because i think it will get in the way of therapeutic alliance or um, possible future work they actually resolved and then considered returning and if i had if i had just you know handed over the notes there would have been a liability problem and um, liability for what for not getting consent from both parties yeah so i wasn't going to do it unless until i was really sure that it was um that i was protected in whatever action i took but it would have it would have just undermined any future work yeah well perfect scenario unfortunately is that your notes are so boring that very there's no use yeah. in pulling it and no risk of say you know one of the partners gets their hands on the file there's no risk that anything could be used against the other partner right so that's what i tell all my supervisees to do right but it's so rare that it happens and when it does happen it's pretty low risk anyway you yeah. know like the say that you had included something in the file that might be able to be used against the other person as long as it's within a certain boundary, there's no chance that anyone could be able to sue you, especially effectively, mm -hmm. because you included a relevant clinical detail yeah. in the client file. Right. Uh, um, you know, it's it's not your fault that they disclosed it to you, right? Right. Like if you go to your physician and you say to your physician, um, "I've been smoking my whole life." Right. And now I have problems breathing. And then the physician just writes that in the file. It's, it's relevant yeah. clinically, obviously. Yeah. yeah. Smoking your whole life, that's important to put in notes. And then later, they're trying to sue their employer for air pollution. And the client, the patient file is pulled and it yeah. says in the notes, well, actually, it says here that you, you disclosed to your doctor you've been smoking your whole life, but in court you're saying you never smoked oh. so this is being used against you right. you can't sue the physician for writing a relevant right. detail right. in the same way that as a as a therapist if it's if it's relevant yeah and it, and it happens to be used against somebody then that's we can't be constantly yeah. looking over our shoulder about that having said that it's a lot easier to sleep at night in those situations if you can hand over your file and be pretty sure that uh, that won't even happen. Yeah. You know what I mean? But yeah, getting back to Megan's question, right? Um, is it unusual? Yeah. Uh, but uh, regarding confidentiality, yeah, it's confidential between you and your, uh, and your clinician. Right. It's, it's, it's your confidential information. It's your file. Right. In the same way that all of us have legal access to our medical file, right. um, you have legal access to your to your uh, therapy file, which is considered a medical file in, in the United States. It's all under HIPAA, you know, health information. 
Um, now, in, in terms of what Bob was saying earlier, in terms of having a conversation with a client, I've only had my file pulled once that I can remember out of thousands of clients. Yeah, right. <laughs> and well, did they pull the file for the client that died by suicide? Who's the they? Nobody did. No one did. Yeah. Yeah. So, because I thought there was an investigation. I mean, there was, right? Like you were contacted. I was told that the person was found. I don't recall if there was any investigation beyond that. Her family were estranged from her, so they weren't pursuing anything. And the only other people were some friends and work colleagues. Okay. And nobody requested anything. I, I, yeah. Yeah. He just sat in a drawer. Yeah, it's kind of weird because in the medical world, you know, with online charts and whatnot, you just have to click through a couple menu items and there's your session notes, your progress yeah. notes. You know, like I had my colonoscopy and I'm on, it's through my chart. And so I get a, a notification that there's a new note yeah. for the colonoscopy itself. By the way, I don't know if I've said it, I have a clean bill of health. Yeah. No issues at all. And the colonoscopy itself was a breeze. Yeah. It was... Uh, Is that a pun? I, I, thought, I thought about saying, you know, so to speak, and, and <laughs> I didn't know where it fit, but when I think about it, yeah, you know, because uh, they gave me uh, photos of my insides. Uh -huh. Did you get the doctor to sign the pictures? <laughs> and... It's uh, uh, like a ca cavern, right? Yeah. So they must be blowing air. Air, yeah. Uh, yeah. Or carbon dioxide or something. Some, some form of gas. Some yes. form of gas yeah. that has to come out eventually. Oh, so, yeah. So I figure it, it, they either take it out while I'm... St I don't remember farting a lot when I woke up. No. Or, or after. Yeah. Yeah. So well, it doesn't take long for it to evacuate, but they don't do anything. It just finds its way. At least that's what happened for me. Oh, really? I have very vague memory of any of it, but I did get my doctor to sign off my, my pictures. You do remember having the colonoscopy? I remember just snips, snips of, you know. During? No, 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 no. Oh. I don't remember anything during. It was, I was going. After, after. Yeah, after. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I do remember I asked the guy to sign, <laughs> sign the pictures. <laughs> <laughs> So he did, and I had it framed him and gave it away as a Christmas present. <laughs> oh, at the White Elephant. Yeah, at the White Elephant, yeah. Um, yeah, it, it, apparent, so I was talking about this on the podcast, and uh, some folks were commenting from other countries saying that there's a wide variety of anesthesia procedure things, and in other, some countries, they don't have, you don't get any anesthesia. Whoa. Yeah. I was very happily unconscious. Yeah. It, they just roll you over and go yeah, for it. Yeah. Um, and then in other countries, they'll give you a slight amount of sleepy, relaxing, but yeah. you're still basically aware of the whole thing. Right. And in the United States, you're out. Yeah. You're out like a light. It's so oral, though. No, I don't think it was. I never had gas. Did you have some kind of gas? Uh, you Meaning like nitrous? Yeah. Or I don't know what they use. Yeah. I, I think it's a relaxing. Yeah. But it's propofol is what they use. Propofol. What's that? Is that an oral thing or is that an no, IV? No, it's IV. Yeah. IV. Yeah. I, don't, I guess they gave me an IV. I don't remember it. Oh, yeah. yeah. At colonoscopy, they definitely gave you an IV. Oh, okay. And they definitely gave you propofol. Yeah. Yeah. Because the alternative is a general anesthesia where they literally stop your stop. Yeah. your breathing. <laughs> right. I mean, or you're so knocked out. You're yeah. so unconscious that you're... Uh, I, think it, I think it subdues your brain stem, essentially. So you... I used to know all these terms, but that sort of anesthesia is for more involved procedures right. like Your open appendix. heart surgery or something, yeah. Or, yeah. and they have to breathe for you, and, and therefore there's a lot more risk right. of people dying. Yeah. Whereas with propofol, you're you're just just having a just nap. drugged out. I mean, there are risks, and yeah. the, there needs to be an anesthesiologist that knows what they're doing. It is what I believe killed Michael Jackson. Oh. He was having a really hard hard time sleeping, I think, because of his PTSD from massive amounts of trauma he went through with his dad. Mm. Apparently, there's there's a, a Michael Jackson biopic coming out. Yeah, I, I heard that. And that'll be interesting to see how they handle that, because the things that his father did... I mean, there's abuse, and then there's what Michael Jackson's father did to mm. him. It, it is like beyond the pay. it's it's psychopathic it's cruel mm. it's sadistic what his father did mm. and they all were abused as far as i know 
but Michael had a particular hard time with it because he was so young and his older brothers, I, I, I can't remember, but also, you know, because kids turn on each other. Also, there were a lot of kids. And so the little bit of love you're going to get is going to be spread out pretty thinly. And also the amount of pressure that was on him, given his talent, as soon as he could form memories at the age of four or five or six, he was uh, thrust into the whole system yeah and you know the touring and the the reforming and the the rehearsing and the rehearsing and the yeah. rehearsing and the perfectionism it was really harmful to him yeah and if he did abuse children i think it's you know from my memory of my hypothesis having looked over all the data was that he had as an adult what some people will have which is arrested development of they're not really an adult. They think of themselves as a child and they feel like a child and they want to regress to that place because that's where they last left off with their growth developmentally. And yet they also had, he also had uh, sexual urges and uh, felt safe around other kids, you know, Neverland and all the kids stuff. Yeah. And, and also a, a good dose of modeling about exploitation of bodies and not caring about other people's feelings mm -hmm. really, you know, mm -hmm. and a desperation of, of wanting to just feel okay in mm -hmm. the world and self-hatred about his face and his skin and his nose and, you know, of course, racism. But, yeah. you know, I imagine that mostly because of his father. Mm. And then you get what you get, I think. Anyway... But, um, so propothal, uh, he was having a hard time sleeping from what I understand. And he had a, a full-time uh, physician who would put him to sleep every night. Mm. And from my memory, it was a concoction of several different substances. But anyway, mm. so, um, my, uh, colonoscopy went really well. Great. And, uh, I have a note in my, uh, my chart, but ah. for Megan in Arizona, uh, she's asking if, if it's okay to ask for the file. Yeah. Yep. But the thing is, Megan, is that, um, oh, getting back to what I was saying earlier, I, uh, uh, I have very minimal questions if someone were to ask me, which has only happened once, like mm -hmm. I said, but I would say, oh, I just, you know, I, let me, can I ask what you want it for? Only because I would want to temper expectations. So if Megan were to ask me this question, can I have the file? Cause I want a summary of our work. I would tell her, I will absolutely give you the file. I'll tell you, it's kind of a process because I have to like, you know, print it out and da da da. But some people, it's literally online, so they they can. I think I'm pretty sure some people, younger therapists or newer therapists today, it's it's just like a login or something. Mm. I don't even know. Yeah, I, I write them on paper. Yeah, um, and so um, there's that. But I would tell Megan that the notes are not going to be a summary. Yeah. If you want a summary, like what you were saying, Bob, earlier is. Yeah if you want me to write something up, I can certainly do that. I, I charge for the time right. and I'd be happy to do that. That would be uh, much more of a summary. And I, you know, I'd look over the notes and I'd reflect and think and yeah. um, try to put, but in terms of the notes, it's going to be very, very boring yeah. for a variety of reasons. I think people think that you write, you know, detailed notes about what they talk about or, or, um, you know, but actually no, write as little as possible. I do not want to write anybody's biography. I, yeah. 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 We have psychotherapy notes or process notes that we can keep separate in a separate yeah. file. Right. That is not in the official patient client file. And we're allowed to have that as therapists because they HIPAA and the laws and, you know, society wants us to be able to take notes that aren't um, at risk of harming the client. So if a client were to be talking in a certain direction and I might wonder, hmm, sounds like, well, like, I guess an example would be, I might say, it sounds like my client is abusing their partner. You know, mm -hmm. I, I might hear that in their, you know, they're not telling me that directly, mm -hmm. but I'm hearing signs and I'm like, hmm, I wouldn't, you know, I might write that down. It sounds like maybe she's abusing her husband at home. Yeah. And I write that in the, in the file and I, I, I want that to be on the radar. And if I don't write it in my notes somewhere, I might forget to assess for that. Right. And psychotherapy notes are the property of the therapist. 
Right. And so those are separate and would be much more descriptive than typically a client file would be. But anyway, so Megan, that's what I'd say about that. So yeah. I personally, if I were in your shoes, Megan, I would just ask your therapist to, to write a summary if they would like to, or the two of you can write one together or something. Yeah. I don't know. Next email, anonymous middle tier patron. She says, hi, Dr. Kirk and Bob. I've recently connected with my former teacher who taught me when I was 12. I'm 21 now, and he's now in his late 40s. I had always really admired, respected, and even had a crush on him when I was young. He never made me feel uncomfortable when I was, when I was a student, but now he does. Oh. I was excited to talk to him, but I felt conflicted when he started making it sexual. Oh. And I sometimes reciprocated even though it made me feel uncomfortable. Hmm. Eventually, I told him I couldn't talk to him anymore if it continued, and he apologized, but he continues to cross the same boundaries. Ooh. When I tried to cut him off, he said he thought that I was probably a catfish if I didn't want to see him, and I finally give in. Bob, I assume, since you're a Luddite, you don't know what a catfish is. I don't think I know what that is. Yeah, so catfishing is when one will act like someone else. Like if I were oh. to uh, create an account called Bob Gettle and use your picture and then start, uh, go on Tinder and I act like I'm you. Oh, got it. Um, a typical situation would be, I don't know, you're trying to scam people out of money. Yeah. And so you pull a model's picture, uh, uh, you know, and you act like you're this really attractive person and right. then you get desperate people to fall in love with you online. And then you, you eventually start asking for money. Like I, I really want to come see you, but I need some money. Da, 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 and then yeah. it, it's a scam, but some people do it uh, just because they're cruel. Yeah. And there's some pretty famous cases. There, there was a, an NFL player where it happened a real sensational case where I oh. think he ended up uh, dying. I can't remember exactly a story, but hmm. this happened like, 10 years ago or something, young, young man, football player, uh, had been catfished and was totally in love with someone and had never actually spoken with her. Right. Everyone knew about her, you know, like he would, he would say, this is my girlfriend and that, I can't remember anyway. And there's a lot of, and I watch reality TV. It happens on 90 day fiance sometimes. And it's real sad. You know, at first you're thinking, how could you possibly believe that? Right. Mm -hmm. Like, what would you think? Why would this happen? Why would somebody believe it? Yeah. They were lonely. They were um, intrigued. They were attracted. And uh, they wanted to believe. Right. But, and also that maybe, you know, I don't, people don't lie. Like if I have a worldview where people basically tell the truth, then yeah. Right, exactly. Yeah. So anyway, he is saying, hey, if you don't meet up with me in person, I think you're catfishing me. Well, and okay. <laughs> yeah. And so uh, she says, I finally gave in. Oh, I'm sorry. He was, pr he was pretty normal in person, but he wants to meet with me again over drinks. He even drove to the grocery store I was at to try to see me without my permission. Oh. I feel trapped. Mm. I know logically I can just block him, but I don't want him to dislike me. Oh. End of email. What do you say to that, Bob? Um, well... He's not respecting your boundary. You're saying no, um, and he's pushing or pulling, whatever you want to call it, to have contact with you, and um, it's actually working. So there's a there is a um, component of reinforcement that may be happening here, where um, uh, a bunch of no's with a yes um, thrown in will um, create um, it's a that'll create a reinforcing loop where the person will actually try harder. So um, if you want to get him out of your life, um, it, you want to be as consistent with your no and short as possible. You don't have to respond. And if you do or when you do, um, very short and, and just stick to the same consistent message, no. And eventually he'll give up and go away. But it sounds like he's using some kind of tactic uh, to guilt you or make you feel ashamed or whatever, or make you feel like you should. Um, that's bullshit. Yeah. You are not, you don't owe anybody anything. No. And, and, um, you know, if he finds that disappointing, 
Well, fuck it. So he finds it fucking disappointing. Who gives a fuck? Protect yourself. That's the main thing. You know, yeah, maybe it's going to cost you him liking you, but I'm not really sure that that's worth it. And you might ask yourself, why is that so important to me? Somebody who's actually abusing my trust and I want them to like me. What's that about? Mm -hmm. Like, that's a worthy question, right? And you should still protect yourself. It's totally cool. And we're not on this earth for people to like us, right? So, yeah. Especially this fucker. Yeah, this is not okay, man. Yeah. Well, first off, anonymous military patron, I'm so sorry this happened. Yeah. Yeah, when I think about the teachers that I liked growing up, yeah. to think that something like this would happen to me would just be a real doozy yeah. on my trust or hope in humanity or something. Right. Like, right. Um, it, yeah, it's awful. And you can retain the memories that you have of him when you were 12. Yeah. Uh, you say that he wasn't inappropriate back then, so... Uh, and he probably wasn't. Great. And so that's great. And for you, you can hold on to that. You can value that. You can. You don't have to discard it. You don't have to second guess everything that you've ever thought of. You know, like was right. I wrong about him? Right. Uh, you know, he he's different to you now, and he could have been a, a very good person that yeah. wasn't out to exploit you or any of the other kids potentially. Yeah. Um, but yeah, uh, run. Run, 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 run. Let me tell you, <laughs> anonymous patron, this person is dangerous, capital D. Let me just, I mean, halfway through the email, I was like, run. And then as I'm reading more, I'm like, run, run, run. It's like watching a, a, a you know, a horror movie and, Oh. someone's going deeper into the haunted house. It's like, no, 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 no. Just turn around, go yeah. home, right. watch Netflix, move on. It, your curiosity uh, or whatever it was that was attracting you is not worth it. Yeah, it's not. <laughs> um, there's so much danger here it, it, because let me, let me tell you, let me highlight what's happening. So you reach out to him and uh, uh, you're excited to talk to him and he starts to make it sexual, which is bizarre to one, someone that's that much younger than him. What, you know, if, if you guys consented to a Tinder date or that was the premise, like you're at a, a dance club and yeah. you start talking yeah. and, uh, one thing leads to another and he starts to say, Hey, you look good in that dress. And, um, maybe you're not so into him. Okay, you know, it's it's context. But for a former student, <laughs> uh, you know, is it legal? Yeah, for him to proposition you, he, he, you're 21. It, it's absolutely yeah. not illegal. It's not pedophilia. It's not child abuse. No. But it's not typical. You know, most uh, teachers in his position would even if they had a sexual attraction, would say, well, this is not the time or the place. Yeah. Um, so the fact that he even started that is a little questionable at the very least. Yeah. But not, like I said, no. uh, something that would be automatically something to judge him over. But then you say that, you know, you tried to push back. But here's the thing. Even though it was uncomfortable for you, you sometimes reciprocated. So not only is he a big problem, but you have a vulnerability to this. Yeah. Because if, uh, uh, you know, I'll tell you, if it were me, and I, I, this, I can say this because I'm a man, it's easier for me to say this. Mm. I would not reciprocate if I, if I wasn't comfortable. I, I've been in situations where I, I've been forced to reciprocate those kinds of things and it's a lot like i said safer for me because generally speaking men are not targeted or um, as much in danger um, in the least men can be in danger in situations like this for sure but just given my trauma history or whatever i that's not a vulnerability of mine so you can't necessarily even trust that you will be able to know that you deserve boundaries given your behavior already hmm. so um so there's that but Eventually, you say, I told him I couldn't talk to him anymore if it continued, the, the sexual stuff continued. Yeah. So at that point, 
now we are at the why in the road. Yeah. If he respects that and is mortified <laughs> and like, oh shit, yeah, sorry, uh, totally. Right. Uh, I that yeah. I I I I think I thought things were, but okay. Sorry. Yeah. I feel so awkward now. I'm so I feel so bad. Right. If he did that and stuck to it, yeah, as a normal human would, <laughs> then maybe you trust him moving forward. Mm-hmm. But the fact that he continues, yeah, you told him no more, and he continues to cross the same boundaries in any situation. If it's your husband, for fuck's sake, that does this, that's a problem. Yeah, I don't care how close your relationship is. This relationship, it's already suspect that it's happening. And the fact that you drew a boundary and he continues to cross it, like I said, in any circumstance, that's a huge red flag, especially in one like this. Um, because of at least the energy around the fact that you were once 12 and in his class so you know you would it's just it has that feel to it yeah. of exploitation right. and preying on someone that right. is um, power have a lot less power. power yeah um so so that's red flag number one massive red flag if you told me if you stopped there i'd be like run 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 because it takes a special kind of human being to continue to do what he is doing. He is a very particular sort of sicko that you need to be as far away as possible from danger. And it's not just innocent cross or not, it's not innocent, but it, it won't stop yeah. with just him crossing these sexual boundaries. That is not what I see. What I see is the beginning of massive exploitation and harm, and maybe even getting off on watching other people squirm. Ugh. Because for Bob and I, as red blooded American dudes <laughs> <laughs> that have all the uh, uh, horniness or whatever that you would expect a, a, a person within the bell curve to have. Mm -hmm. Uh, isn't that a sexy statement? That's what I, if I was dating right now, that would be on my bell, uh, that'd be on my Tinder profile. On the bell curve, I'd say like I, I'm smack, I'm somewhere within a, one or two standard deviations of <laughs> of horniness right now. <laughs> and, but um, for Bob and I, you couldn't pay us enough money to do what he's doing. No, oh, God, no. This this has nothing to do with him being attracted to you or you being attractive or whatever you know what i mean this, no this, this is, is something sick this is a dynamic this is a power dynamic some kind of push some kind of exploitation or attempt at it yeah he wants to do this he's risking a lot by doing it because yeah. usually or a lot of the times this probably doesn't work yeah so he's going beyond that he's accepting that risk because he likes this right and that is the problem. It, with people like this, it does not stop with, well, I'll just get together with him or I'll just entertain this boundary crossing. No. It, it won't stop there. No. It's, it's not, well, it, I'll just give him this one gift. It'll calm him down and then, I, then I'll be safe. No. No. <laughs> no, it just reinforces. Right? Yeah. 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 It, it'll, the line just keeps moving. Right. So, um, now, I can't know this with 100% certainty, but I'm pretty damn sure about this yeah. because, again, 99% mm. of people wouldn't even come close to this. Like I said, most yeah. people would be, oh, my God, I'm so sorry. Yeah, even, mortified. If, even if you, anonymous patron, were the one who was flirting first. Right. And you initiated everything. Right. And then eventually you're just like, yeah, I, I don't want to do that anymore. Right. Most people would be... Mortif oh my God, you know? Yeah, 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 yeah. sorry. Oh, yeah. Right. Uh, because most people don't want to cross those lines. Yeah, you know? they don't they, want they, to. They want, they, they want there to be overt consent. Right. <laughs> you know? but, so uh, going on, it says, eventually I told him I couldn't talk to him anymore if it continued. Yeah. Oh, right, right. And then, and, and then that's when he, and then he crossed. Okay. 
When I tried to cut him off, he said he thought I was probably a catfish. Ugh. So he tugged at that string and you went with it. Yeah. Again, I'm not victim blaming an honest patron, but you can't trust yourself given these, I, I'm hearing, I wasn't comfortable with it being sexual to begin with, but right. I reciprocated anyway. Right. I didn't want to talk to him anymore. I cut him off. He accused me of catfishing, as Bob was saying. Who cares? He can believe it was a catfish. Yeah. All the better, honestly, because if yeah, he thinks it's a no stranger, way. then um, you can claim it was a catfish and that you never talked to sure. him. Uh, but you actually gave in. Yeah, I'm not victim blaming, but you can't trust yourself. So you, uh, So when it comes to stalking and abusive uh, people, we need a whole team around Yeah, a us. team. I like that. Yeah. Um, and then you say he was pretty normal in person. Of course he was, because he's trying to suck you in, yeah. love bombing, the whole thing. But he wants to meet with me again over drinks, because I'd give it a 50% chance he wants to drug you with those drinks. Oh, God, how awful. But at the very, I mean, honestly, yeah, I, I would not be surprised. But, um, but if, uh, at the very least, he wants you to be intoxicated because oh. he's hoping that you'll be pliable yeah and you are pliable is a thing yeah i'm not blaming you but y you mm. can't trust yourself without a team you need a team around you you uh, um you need support this cannot be done yeah. even if you're not uh, uh, vulnerable to this dealing with a stalker which this is yeah this is stalking it, it is impossible for anyone to cope alone because of how scary it is, how to, how confusing it is, mm. how sort of gaslighty it can become, brainwashy it can become. Going on here and here, and so again, at this point in the email, I'm like, run, 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 run. You say, he even drove to the grocery store I was at to try to see me without my permission. Yuck. What the fuck? <laughs> How did he know you were there? I mean, even if you said, I'm at the at the QFC or the Kroger or the Safeway or whatever yeah. um, in such town, uh, uh, even if he said that, he drives out to see you? Yeah. Stalking, run, yeah. sadistic, rapist, mm. run. Yeah. <laughs> um, and yeah, as Bob says... Uh, you know, when you say you don't want him to dislike you, um, I want him to dislike you. Oh, right. <laughs> I, I want him to dislike me. I don't want anyone of this nature, if they like you or me or anybody like us, um, that's not a good sign. <laughs> we want stalkers to be so frustrated with us that they hate us because if they like us, then uh, in a situation like, you know, then uh, it means, so that's your gauge on Amos Patron is if he likes you, you're on the wrong path. Right. If he dislikes you, you're on the right path. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, and again, another indication, Patron, that you're not, uh, uh, that you don't have uh, the uh, foundation to do this alone. You're saying... You need a foundation, you need a team to yeah. support you yeah. and help you hang in. Yeah. Yeah. Agree. Perspective. Um, and getting back to what Bob said, yeah, as short of a communication as possible that is firm and never reply. You know, it's yeah. something like, I've contacted the authorities. I, well, I don't know if you want to say that. Because sometimes you, you want to play a game where you just want to gray rock them and um, slowly back your way out the door because if you go after them with threats, they might come back with threats yeah. and that might make it hard to sleep at night. So um, like what I would do if I were near, if I were a part of your team, I would recommend that you tell him, um, I'm sorry that I, uh, you know, I, I can't continue with this relationship. I um, just want to tell you that I, I had a, you know, I have fond memories of you as a teacher when I was growing up, and I, 
don't want to date you and I don't want to be a friend. I don't want to talk to you anymore. Yeah. Uh, it was nice to catch up at times with you. <laughs> um, and then you say, um, and I would appreciate it if you uh, didn't try to contact me. Right. Because I don't want yeah. to continue with this. Right. That's clear. Something like that. And then you send that off. He replies. If he's like, cool, you know, yeah. nice catching up, then you move on with your life. If he's like, hey, you know, I thought you said you'd be, my, you know, he'll do something. Right. He's going to try to uh, get Engage. his hooks into you. Yeah. He might even literally show up at your work or uh, something. I hope not. And so um, at that point, you want, and you want to be ready for that. You don't want it to catch you off guard because that yeah. could absolutely happen. I would right. absolutely expect it to happen. It'd be right. weird if it didn't, honestly, given wh what he's shown us. Right. And then you want to have a response to that and, and um, say, you know, some other communication. Okay, I told you I wanted it over and you, you were continuing to try to engage. I am now going to block you. And if I see you, I have been told that I need to call the police. Right. If you show up at my work or if you show up at the grocery store or, um, you know, I've been told by my friends and family and my therapist uh, or whoever it is that you want to identify. Cause if you say you've talked with a bunch of people, right. That's what deflates them. They want you isolated. Yeah. Right. Right. So if you tell them, I have told everyone what's happening, mm -hmm. I've, I've shown them the exchange. You know, again, you, you don't necessarily want to lead with this. There's a lot of strategy that goes on <laughs> because if you lead with it again, it could provoke. Yeah. But um, you, so you want to give them a chance to just, you know, you want to be firm, mm -hmm. give them a chance to just drift away. But if they don't do that, then you have to bring up a little bit more of a heavy gun of, I, I've talked with everybody. And again, this is all in writing. This is, you never talk. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've, I've talked with my friends and family and my therapist, and they've all told me that you are not to be trusted given that you aren't respectful of boundaries. Right. And so I am now going to be blocking you. And if I see you again or you contact me again, I will at the very least alert my therapist and, and my support system. I might even call the authorities. Mm -hmm. And then if he contacts you, you follow through. Follow through. And, and maybe even have other people contact him. Like, like uh, if you get a police officer involved or a domestic violence uh, advocate or your mom or somebody, <laughs> just anyone, because if, if you get other people to contact him, then again, it sends a signal. Yeah. You're not dealing with a vulnerable, isolated right. person. Yeah. You're dealing with a whole team. And right. that, that'll, that'll typically end it right there. But I would be very, very concerned, and I would, uh, around those times, not sleep alone, honestly. Not to freak you out, but <laughs> for a while, I would have make sure that you have people around you that are with you 24-7 kind of a thing. As a man, uh -huh. myself, that's, that's what I would do, mm -hmm. let alone if I were a very young, vulnerable woman mm -hmm. in the society. So this is, this is no joke. No fucking joke. This guy is a, you know, people talk about red flags all the time. And this is beyond red flag. This is what's beyond red, like infrared. <laughs> it's red, hot infrared <laughs> flag. This flag is like uh, burning red with my rage. Okay. Yeah. Let's take a break. What do you say? Yeah. All right, we're back from the break. So middle tier patron Mimi from Oklahoma, she says, uh, and I'll summarize the beginning. Basically, she was trained as a marriage and family therapist 30 years ago, but uh, sh for whatever reason, she didn't work in the field until recently. Hmm. So she's getting back into it. And so she says, could there be such a thing as a borderline couple? Com combined, they present with borderline features. I have been seeing a couple for six years. I wouldn't describe either as borderline, but together I find myself with similar feelings as I do with individuals I would consider borderline. Side note, I'm fairly confident my mother was also borderline, so heightened emotions challenge me the most. 
heightened emotions challenge me. With my couple, I sometimes sense their fear of abandonment, more so with one. At times, I have felt idealized and at other times devalued by the couple. They have no strong identity outside of a conflict about his mother, potentially borderline as well. As a couple, they present often with anger and mood changes. He can be hypervigilant and she can dissociate. Both have had childhood sexual trauma. I love your podcast and give you much credit for helping me to re-enter this amazing arena and of email. Bob, you're shaking your head. What, what's your reaction? Um, th as a case conceptualization, I don't understand the question. Like, I don't know how you're helped by thinking about things in terms of this, in this, in these terms, like borderline personality disorder is a way to think about what happens for somebody so that you can understand them and try to help them. But a borderline couple isn't, isn't a case conceptualization I think that you can do anything with. So um, if it were me, I'd be thinking about, are they, uh, are they um, folks that are, tend to be more high arousal? And are they folks that tend to be either avoidant or angry, angry, what do they call it? Angry, anxious, anxious, angry, something like that. The, so the pursuing type or the withdrawing type, and then are they low arousal or high arousal? So it just sounds like you have two people that are high arousal who are both um, 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 maybe on the, on the, like uh, the pursuing or the, uh, what do they call it? I don't know why I don't know this language. Distancing? Uh, no, the other one. Pursuing distancing? Yeah. But they sounds like they're both the description. Preoccupied, yeah, preoccupied. Thank you. That's the that's the word. Okay. They both sound like they're preoccupied. Just the little little uh, here. That's what went through my head is that maybe they're both just preoccupied. Okay, yeah. fine. Um, so if uh, if it's a couple, I think the thing to think about is well, what's happening in their relationship? What are they? What are they um, setting off in one another? What are they triggering in one another? And how are they reinforcing their cycle? And um, um, so I, I, so I don't find this a particularly helpful way to um, conceptualize a couple. So I would encourage you to drop it and find a different way to conceive them so that you can help them. Yeah. I think, uh, the only thing I'll add, I agree with everything Bob is saying, nothing in your description of them would lead me down a road of conceptualizing anyone as borderline really. And honestly, there seems to be a, a lot of borderline labeling happening here, <laughs> Mimi. Now, maybe it's all accurate and if we are at least uh, cogent and and demonstrable by data. You know, it's a short email, but in this pretty short email, you have kind of diagnosed a number of people, your mom, which I would respect more than these other uh, labels because you know your mom very well, but the couple and... Uh, someone's mom, I think that the husband's mom. The husband's mom, yeah. Um, now again, if you gave us the full story, maybe we'd be like, oh, okay, uh, maybe there's something there. But um, I can't, I'm trying to imagine a situation in which me, I would, I don't, I don't know if I conceptualize them as being a quote-unquote borderline couple, but I'm trying to imagine a situation in which two people that I did not believe were on the spectrum of borderline personality, and yet together they would demonstrate that. The, the data point that you're pointing to is the way that the couple makes you feel, which is something that I absolutely pay attention to oh, hell yeah. in my early assessment of any personality disorder, because well, I typically will have an inducement of, of some fear and some terror, you know? some adrenaline that I will have a hard time putting my finger on, you know? Yeah. So well, it makes sense to consider your countertransference as you try to understand what's happening in a couple. Right. Or an individual. But right. In this case, a couple. Right. Um, but there's so many pathways to having that familiar terror feeling that don't involve borderline. Now, you know, it's a language system. Maybe you could convince me, Mimi, that the way you're looking at it actually helps you to help them. But I would suspect, given that you've been out of the field for 30 years, um, I don't know if you're currently being supervised again, or if you have a, a refresher in refamiliarizing yourself. I, you know, I personally can't imagine having, you know, well, Bob and I went to graduate school about almost 30 years ago. Yeah. Uh, 29 years ago is yeah, when we started. That's right. 
And I, uh, I think from your email, you were saying it was more than 30 years that you graduated. I'm not sure. But anyway, you know, yeah. s- similar distance, you and right. I. Yeah. I can't imagine having not worked in the field <laughs> and not had a podcast and not been a professor and not been a supervisor. And then suddenly I'm hanging a shingle and I'm meeting with people. I, I can't imagine how overwhelmed and how ungrounded I would feel. For me, if, if I were in your shoes, I would consider my graduate degree to essentially be gone from my brain. Yeah. <laughs> because it's a cursory introduction to the field to begin with. Yes. And to have that just a distant memory. And plus, the education back then and the requirements back then were half, literally, or less than what they are today. Like your degree, oh. your your counseling degree was was a year and a half. Six quarters. Yeah, 16 classes. So I, I know at least two of them were diagnostics and, and psychopathology, which is a cursory introduction Very to, cursory. to the DSM. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and, and then I know that you and I had ProSem at least two, if not three quarters. That, that, that was essentially like counseling skill or, or person of the therapist yeah. kind of stuff. Yep. I know there was a, so that's five classes. And again, an introduction. I know that we had a counseling skills class, communication counseling. I, I don't know what it was called back then, mm-hmm. but like how to general therapy skills mm-hmm. class. There was a theories class that we took, I remember. Yeah, personality theories. Right. Well, Therapy theories. Therapy theories, right. Yeah. And I remember one of the weeks that we oh, took this class, right. we studied reality therapy, which nobody talks about anymore. <laughs> and so, yeah. uh, and again, we had like a week on cognitive behavioral therapy. A week on psychoanalysis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so that's seven classes. Um, I know we had a development class <laughs> you and I took, and it was... Uh, I liked the class. Oh, it's yeah, one like, of the more memorable classes yeah, that memorable. we took, yep. but had almost nothing to do with human development. No. It, it was a class in which we wrote a myth. F- a myth, right. It was about, um, although I will say that I learned, uh, like, uh, l- dear listener, it, when you hear me yammer about ceremony and ritual and rites of passage and yeah. how American mainstream culture because of the immigration assimilation mandate, uh, erased all of the protocols from the homeland. You have a bunch of Americans that have almost no rituals, no rites of passage, no traditions about how to demarcate the before and the after, the betwixt and between, as our book was titled. And we have things like graduations or like weddings or funerals, but those are often, especially funerals, don't have enough in there. And when you see other cultures that have had a longer time to develop ritual and ceremony and meaning, uh, you'll see a lot more details to it. Not that we need to be doing that, but it just shows that uh, certain uh, transitions in life, you know, in terms of our mental health, require a lot of activity. Yeah. Like in you know, some places of Southeast Asia, they will have an entire altar to their ancestors that's just sitting in their living room. Um, and there are some cultures where a year after death, I think they'll they'll dig up the remains, oh. and uh, you know, they'll, then there'll be a whole ceremony around what you do with the bones and the whatnot. And uh, it's a you know, it's it's built into a religious notion of like the afterlife and this kind of thing. But I think more importantly, it shows that uh, our grieving process doesn't end after a few weeks, you know, like a year later, there's, there's a revisiting of it. And if we have something to gather around in terms of ritual, like uh, digging up the remains and taking care of it, right? It feels like you're still tending to this loved one. Yeah. And it gives you a chance to talk as a community or as a family about the individual. It gives you a chance to think about that individual. And I, you know, all that is important. And so I got that from this class, but the class was supposed to talk about general human development. <laughs> yeah. Like the basics 
in our field. No. And we didn't get that. Anyway, there's no, a few other read, classes. We read novels, actually, as part of the learning. Right. And, and I agree. Not a, it was a good class for what it was, but it wasn't something else. It was, certainly wasn't rigorous in terms of yeah. um, developing psychology or counseling skills. Right. We should have at least touched on attachment theory. <laughs> as, as Nobody. You, but that was not even, not even discussed in yeah, the least, right. really in any class. We took a sex class, human sexuality class. Human sexuality class. Right. We, we took that together right. as well. I took a family systems class. Our, our human sexuality teacher was arrested yep. later. Yep. I don't know that that reflects on our learning, but uh, yeah. But it, it is kind of interesting, though, because he was arrested, if I remember right, for propositioning a minor. Yeah. He had propositioned young like teenagers yeah he also in our human sex so but when we when i look back at our human sexuality class there are some kind of i don't know how to interpret it now like oh, do uh -huh. you remember the what we did in that class not much uh, well, well we wrote our papers we wrote our sexual autobiography yeah oh that's right right you've talked about this a few times like is he getting off on reading people's histories well i, I maybe i did not think at the time no but he was very specific in requiring us to be as self-disclosing and right. detailed as possible yeah. about our developing sexuality. Right. Like we're supposed to talk about us as teenagers yeah. and how our sexuality was developed. I didn't have a whole lot to say. <laughs> <laughs> what grade did you get? <laughs> I don't know. I, I do know this. I accidentally put my name in the header. So we we're supposed to just identify by a number. Right. Right. But um, I had a habit. I used to put my name in the header on all papers. So my right. name was, I still have that paper in my attic. I should yeah. dig it out. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, he had us anonymize our papers because he wanted to encourage us to be as yeah. as self-disclosing as possible during the class i felt, felt i felt fine and i still basically feel fine but hearing about his issue you wonder you wonder right um another thing that he did is he you know we watched porn and i don't remember that oh i do <laughs> <laughs> it was it was not your typical porn let's just oh, put it that way oh, okay I mean, I don't even know if you would call it porn. It was more instructional demonstration. Of sexual function. Uh, of sexual acts. Sexual, you know? yeah, yeah. And it's yeah, funny, you don't really I don't, funny. I don't, I don't remember that. that either. I do not remember watching anything in that class. I, I, I can see the movie or the you, instructional you video. Can I can, it, huh? there's, a few, there's a few scenes that yeah. I remember. I mean, you know, it was just notable that we're... Yeah in graduate school and yeah. and it's fine you know and i hey man everyone was fine but but again hearing later yeah. you wonder was something going on something something weird yeah, yeah. maybe yeah anyway so mimi point is uh, if your education was similar to ours which i'm guessing it was in terms of how brief it was yeah compared to today i would just make sure that you have a lot of in-person instruction and supervision i've had people who have in the past hired me post-graduation as their supervisor and they've explicitly told me that they chose me because I am a professor mm -hmm. and they said I need you to basically start from the beginning mm -hmm. of graduate school for me because I don't trust that my graduate school instructed me adequately mm -hmm. I when I would work with these folks I would find that it was true mm -hmm. <laughs> for one reason either they forgot it or their program wasn't very good right and I would not supervise them in the typical way. I would basically be teaching them mm -hmm. alongside of supervising their, yeah. their practice. So now we could just be reading your email wrong, but well. it, 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 there's nothing here like, okay, well, getting back to the question like of a borderline couple. So if a, if a couple didn't present this way, but maybe they had leanings and then the two of them, but if this were true, I could only come to the conclusion that they were already on both of them, the borderline personality spectrum. And I just have not looked into it deeply enough because if they're both triggering each other mm -hmm. and both of them look like they are presenting with borderline features, I can't imagine a scenario where I would think otherwise. Now there are people who can be triggered to become more preoccupied as you were getting at Bob. Yeah. And that can look borderline and, you know, might even say that it's on the spectrum mm. given certain uh, uh, presentations. 
And so, yeah, I could see, I could see two people if they go through a particularly bad time and normally they operate, you know, mostly secure attachment style Mm -hmm. and there's some incursion and they both tend to react with more preoccupation, more pursuing, maybe some paranoia, hypervigilance. Yeah. So maybe, but I wouldn't call them a quote unquote borderline couple. I would just call it two people that when threatened, they tend to react with preoccupation or something. Right. Anyways, take a break. There's Let's, lots oh. of good training to be had. So, you know, there's lots of good couple therapy training and, and you can avail yourself of it. Mm-hmm. I, I am the king of go get trained. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right, let's take a break. What do you say? Yep. Okay, well, let's do an OPP, an old patron praise. These people became patrons all the way back in 2021 and have stayed patrons through thick and thin, through all the good moments and the bad moments. All these folks, these patrons, are from outside the United States. I grouped them together. Right on. So we have Renan from Paris, France. I think I'm pronouncing that right i'm not sure mm-hmm. uh we have evgenia from southampton great britain amina from manchester great britain also mary from manchester jacqueline from caterham great britain i'm sure i'm pronouncing that wrong right caterham it's probably like or something I don't know. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um <laughs> uh, Jelena from Witten, Great Britain. I'm just going to pronounce it as it looks. I'm sure it's wrong. Uh, Becky from Sheffield. I know that one. Ah. Sheffield. Sheffield? Or maybe it's Shuffled. Anyway, Great Britain. Robert from Dublin, Ireland. Shane from Limerick, Ireland. Huh? Eva from IS. Oh, Reykjavik from, from Iceland. Iceland. Reykjavik. Uh, Christine from Harlem, the Netherlands. Zita from Amsterdam, Netherlands. Mahandria, Mahandria, or yeah, it's probably Mahandria from Norway. Uh, Snafrisk, I'm sure I'm getting this wrong, from Norway. Idun from Norway. Brit from Norway. Mr. Dunsky from Poland, Warsaw. Una from Serbia. Serbia. Anza from SA. Riyadh. Riyadh? Where's Riyadh. what? Where's Riyadh? Oh, I should know. Saudi Arabia. Duh. Duh. <laughs> okay, we're getting an F in geography. <laughs> Maria from Stockholm, Sweden. Karen from Sweden as well. I mean, the the problem is is Patreon when it tells me what city it is. It's a it's there's like wingdings in the name because in other languages they have like umlauts and accents and stuff right and if you're you're going off of the english available symbols for letters it gets translated into our system with basically what look like wingdings you know like there's uh, in in this swedish uh, city name there's a y that looks that's the but it's a symbol for yen you know the japanese symbol for yen is that like a C with the lines? No, it's a Y with two lines in it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, and they that, that's the character there. That's part of the word that, that's part of the of the the way they're spelling this town in Sweden. Uh-huh. And, um, and, and so it makes it hard for me to, and some of their names have this. Like this one has more wingdings in it. And so I don't know how to pronounce it, but it mm-hmm. looks like da, Daya, Daya from Slovenia, from mm-hmm. Maribor, Slovenia. Anyway, uh, this has been the geography section of, of this. The of, butching, of, butchering. Of, butchering of, of geography. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I could like do a, some homework beforehand, but I find it's much more entertaining when I struggle my way through it. Yeah. Um, Still, amazing. Yeah. Like all over the world, man. Yeah. Um, Middle tier patron Kane from Richmond, I assume Virginia, if they don't give like where... Right, Richmond, probably, probably Richmond, probably Virginia. But, but don't we have a Richmond, Washington, Richland, right? Richland. Okay. Yeah. Uh, many therapy goers like to talk about inspirational and influential things their therapists have said to them. Oh. Have any client interactions been particularly influential or inspirational in your personal or professional life as a therapist, Bob? Yes, many. Uh, though you're going to ask me to sort of name one. Well. I had a DBT student who completely shifted my attitude around um, how to respond to folks who are asking for money on the street. That was sticks with me and think about it often. 
I, the answer to my question to your question is absolutely, and I can't remember a single one right now. Yeah, I would say that it's much more common that for me, and I'm guessing for you, Bob, that it's not a mind blowing inspirational experience, but in the moment, an inspirational experience. Yeah. It's quite common after a session that I will, you know, go to my wife and say, I love you or right. I'm sorry for something. Yeah. Yeah. Um, because I'll see a client do it and right. I will say, Oh, that's, I, I'm, I'm inspired now to do right. that myself. Yeah, me too. So that happens, you know, I would say at least once a week, if not more. Yeah. Or, you know, I was talking with a client recently and they discovered this um, mindfulness practice and they were talking about how much it helped them. And, and I said, wow, you're reminding me about how to be in the moment right. and how to pay attention to my body and how to notice when my mind is going far away from my body and into the future or something. Right. And, uh, you know, thank you for that. You know, I said that. So, um, it's much, you know, that happens all the time, but in terms of right. just like the kind of things that a client would feel like, uh, uh, and I wouldn't say this is incredibly common, but you can imagine times where as a client, you might think like, wow, there was that one moment in therapy that just completely upended things for me and helped me. Um, like me for, as a client, I remember my therapist that I asked for word of mouth, uh, you know, references for a therapist that would quote unquote kick my ass and certainly was given a reference <laughs> for that. And he, uh, and I told him in the beginning too, you know, I, I said, I, I, I don't want to be coddled. I, I want you to really get after me. And he did. And he, um, I remember I was complaining and you know saying I was very upset about something and he's and I was describing what I was doing in the moment and I thought he was going to say oh good for you that you advocated for yourself or mm -hmm. that you were having your feelings and what he said was wow pretty histrionic <laughs> 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 and not you know cuz I was opening up and uh -huh. I was looking for the opposite kind of response from him sure and it stung like hell oh i'll bet but it very quickly was appreciated because mm -hmm. it was histrionic <laughs> meaning it was narcissistic in a way yeah i was focusing on me or some kind of distortion imposing really yeah. on others and it uh stuck with me you know as a therapist i'm trying to think of a time when I wonder if that's really hard to achieve given my mindset when I'm working with clients, right? I'm not there for me. No. So if something were to transform me, I would it would have to be so mind-blowing <laughs> that it would pull me out of paying attention to the client and pull me into myself. Yeah. Um, next email, middle tier patron Sonia. She says, hi, Dr. Kirk and Bob. Why do you think older people often complain? I've been spending a lot of time with my 83-year-old grandmother lately, and she does what seems to be common for people her age. She complains about the modern world a lot and doesn't feel like learning new things. She likes thinking about the way things used to be. Do you think this is natural, or is it something that should be treated despite how common it is? Common it is? Bob, what do you think? I wasn't aware that old people complained. So it's definitely a stereotype. Yeah. You know, old man shakes fist. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Get or, off get off my driveway. Yeah. Damn kids. Right. Yeah. Um uh why? Uh maybe because we fear death. If it if it's true, maybe it's because we fear death. Or um because we feel lonely, or maybe we feel like life has passed us by. Um Maybe we feel like we're no longer relevant. Colleen said to me last week, she's like, I'm 61. I am now invisible. Because mm. the world only looks at women who are, you know, whatever, young or something. I mean, I would say, given the sexism in our society, that happened long ago. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> um, unfortunately. 
you know, yeah. like actors right. will say, women actors will say that they hit 40 and it's over, right. you know. So, so, you know, maybe um, it's a compounding of, if this happens, maybe it's a compounding of loss and um, sadness, grieving. Um, but I, I don't know. I never thought about it before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a stereotype. And therefore, I will resist it unless I saw the data. The amount of ageism, especially that I see online, is it's just infuriating. The way that people talk about, quote unquote, boomers it's fucking annoying because all the quote unquote boomers, meaning my parents' generation, which I believe my parents are technically the forgotten generation yeah, because they're, they're born during the war. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if we just sort of say they were late forgotten and early boomers or something, yeah. every older person that I know never complains. I want them to complain more, Yeah, <laughs> but they don't. So this notion that somehow they're always complaining, it's just perpetuated by stereotypes. The w One, the, the way that older people are depicted in media. Two, the way that they're talked about online. Ageism is alive and well. And the uh, license that people have to just, and not just old people, but young people <laughs> as well. There's, there's ageism is going all over the place. And... It needs to fucking stop. And this idea, you know, it'd be like saying, you know, what's up with black people and looting or something? You know, I, I, I went on, you know, how come black people are always looting stores? That's what this is like. Uh -huh. How come old people complain all the time? It's a stereotype. Yeah. Now, if you have data that shows that the bell curve is a little bit to the right of, on average, as we age, we're more likely to be negative or complain maybe you know we could definitely point to how older people have a an increase in their risk of depression which could make someone negativistic yeah. um also the older you get everything starts falling apart for you uh -huh. um, everyone starts dying around you yeah. the world is moving on without you the world is treating you like shit <laughs> uh in general and so are there you know it's sort of like how come women are always complaining and you know, wives are always nagging and nagging and nagging? <laughs> and it's like, well, maybe because they live in a misogynistic, paternalistic society that one never listens to them and two, like, is constantly a thorn in their side. Yeah. So maybe that's why they're quote unquote nagging all the time. And this notion of like, oh, old people, I was, I was complaining. Like, I, your grandmother is complaining, but this notion that somehow all old people are yeah. complaining is. I'd love to see the data. And also the simplistic notion that somehow just because you're old, you're supposed to start complaining or just, just because you're grumpy and old or something. I don't know. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Now, whatever she's complaining about, if you want to focus on her and say, Hey, you know, maybe it's your attitude. Cause maybe it is, you know, maybe she's just choosing to be negative. Some people do that. Yeah then help her with that. But, you know, it's quite possible that her complaints are valid. People don't mm -hmm. usually complain. In fact, nine times out of 10, when there is a reason to complain, people don't complain because they're afraid of being not heard and stigmatized, you know? Yeah. So I love it when people complain, especially if it's not about me <laughs> because, <laughs> you know, I, I, I don't have to do anything. Yeah. I can listen and go, wow, that fucking sucks. Yeah. I mean, that's, you know, what half of what being a therapist is to some extent. Yeah. Um, complaining is one of, one of my favorite things to, to participate in. And once it happens, you know, typically the complaining will end because you're being heard. You yeah. Know? Okay. Well, that does it for that episode, Bob. Oh. Everyone out there, please take care of yourself because you deserve it.